They didn't do great. Let's see how well you do. All right. So the first question is, can anybody name the six organizing partners? Oh, they're on the slide. <laughs> I can get rid of that real easy. All right. Anybody want to take a stab at that? The six organizing partners. Thanks for pointing that out. San Jose Water uh, District. That's one. PG&E. AIA, East Bay Mud, no, USGBC, um, SFPUC was the last one, that's the six, great, that covers all of that, um, I can bring this up now, <laughs> collectively you did great, collectively you did great, um, all right, so those are the those are the six organizations for the um, that organize this event. This is our 16th annual. We always try to plan it around World Water Day, which is when tomorrow. You can find more at worldwaterday.org. Uh, where will you get the materials? This is your quiz. Online, where? The Water Conservation Showcase website, and when will they be posted? April, yeah. So it takes a little while for us to edit the videos. We're recording everything. So look for the um, both the PowerPoints um, and the recording in April. How about evaluations? How will those be done? There's a survey monkey that'll go out um, probably next week. There's a door prize. Um, and where will that be held and when? Yeah, good, who said that? Downstairs, 5.30, bing, 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 correct. So in the conference center after the uh, Water Champion Awards, we will uh, hand out a bunch of door prizes. Now for the continuing education credits, if you need U.S. Green Building Council GBCIs, the number is on the screen. You self-report your attendance at this session. If you are an AIA um, member and need CEUs, could you raise your hand? Okay, I'll bring this over. I think we've covered it with a couple people. So that's that's that, and bring that slide up. Okay, so um, egress for this room is through this door down the hallway, and on the left is a stairwell. You go down the stair, you're in the front of the building. Exit out the back, go down the yellow stair. You can turn right or left. Either way, you end up outside the building. Uh, another quiz question, where's our convening location? Carousel, which is at what intersection? Fourth and Howard Street, good, you're doing well. Um, there is an emergency where we don't exit the building. That emergency is, in, er in an earthquake, we do duck and cover as best we can. Um, <laughs> we don't have a lot of tables. <laughs> we don't have a lot of tables in this room, but the restrooms are out the classroom door to the right, and I think that covers all my announcements. So, um, our um, Last session in this room is on the water energy nexus, which is a topic we address every year. As you know, um, those of you who have been attending the Water Showcase for many years, by the way, show of hands, anybody in the room that's attended at least 10 water conservation showcases? At least 10. How about, I bet you've been to 10, Alice. I bet you've been to 10. Um, how about at least five? Yeah, we get a lot of people who come for this event. Um, and we recognize the many interconnections between energy use and water use, which is why we address this topic uh, with the Water Showcase, at least one session every year. So today we have two speakers, both coming from Southern California, both working on some sort of rather ambitious uh, water infrastructure efforts. Uh, Eric Porce is going to start. He's a research engineer in the Office of Water Programs at Sacramento State and a visiting assistant researcher at UCLA. Uh, his research focuses on urban water and energy management. He holds degrees in civil engineering, public policy. Um, before returning to graduate school, Eric worked as a counterintelligence analyst, a systems engineer with the United Nations, and a study abroad program leader in Africa for uh, Earlham College. And then uh, after Eric, Nicholas Chow is a water engineering project manager for the Luskin Center for Innovation focusing his efforts on sustainable water strategies. His current work centers around the interaction between water and energy, building on the one water principles of developing healthier and more sustainable water management practices. 
environmentally, economically, and socially. Nicholas also works on developing innovative economic uh, and infrastructure practices that generate wider water sector and societal benefits. So with that, I'm gonna have Eric start us off. Great, thanks very much. It's uh, great to be here. Um, welcome to the green room. I get to go back and tell my five-year-old son whose favorite color is green that I got to present in the green room, and he's gonna be so excited. <laughs> It'll be great. Uh, so my name's Eric. I'm, as, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, I'm a research engineer at OWP at Sac State. We're probably the biggest little research office you've never heard of. Uh, we've got 40 staff. We've been around for about 40 years. Um, we're one of the nation's premier sources for continuing education and training manuals for water and wastewater treatment operators. So there's a good chance that you can say thank you next time you flush your toilet for the guy or gal on the other end knowing what, what to do with it. Uh, say thanks to Sac State at OWP. Uh, we're also applied research. We do a lot of applied research with state agencies and local agencies, um, stormwater, water resources, and then we also um, were the EPA's Environmental Finance Center for the EPA Region 9. Uh, and we've been that for a couple of years now. So we joined the largest segment of water fin of environmental finance centers and we work on affordability rates, all that kind of, um, all, all those intersections of utilities and providing water services. So as, uh, as was mentioned, I'm also a visiting researcher at um, UCLA and I continue to work with a whole bunch of folks and we have dug into what you'd say is the, the task of figuring out what the future of water management is in Los Angeles and we've sliced and diced it every way you could possibly do it. We've published a bunch of papers on this, on all different aspects. And so this topic, energy use effects of water conservation and local supplies in Los Angeles, was not actually on the original <clears throat> agenda from the studies from 10 years ago, or when the, when the principal investigators outlined it 10 years ago. But about two or three years ago, I kept getting asked this question, what's the energy implications of this? What's the energy implications of this? I uh, got asked it through uh, journal articles and at conferences and so forth, and I'm like, oh, fine, I'll do this study, that's fine. But we have wanted to do it the right way, and so we actually brought together a whole group of folks on the task for thinking about this. So what we're trying to do is figure out what's the energy for water supply for metropolitan Los Angeles. And metropolitan means 10 million people, it means 100 water retailers, it's a huge kind of system. But first, just to make sure we all have some basic grounding, we need to figure out what the water energy nexus is. Um, when we're, it's basically studying the relationship between energy and water for human needs, of course, right? So you could have energy for water. So that's what I'm gonna talk about here, energy for water management. Um, so that's energy for water supply, water treatment, water distribution, uh, so forth, in homes as well, it's another key one, a preview, preview, preview in homes. Um, and then also uh, water for energy. And there's a, a lots of good scholars working on this too. Uh, Kelly Sanders at USC has done a lot of great work on this. Um, a colleague of mine at, at um, Sac State, Julian Fulton, has done work on this. When we say water for energy, it's the water used in producing energy potentially directly through hydro, for hydropower or maybe indirectly to in thermal cooling and so forth or in buildings. Um, so both of these are important aspects of water and energy relationships. <clears throat> why do we care? Obviously the most important reason why we could care is greenhouse gas emissions, right? That's why we're, what we're really gunning for. But there's other considerations in thinking about the water energy nexus that are very important, say if you're a utility uh, manager, and that's potential cost savings. Can you uh, help your bottom line by reducing energy to provide the same services for water supply? Um, and then there's also the question of with conservation and thinking about energy, you get into all sorts of tricky accounting where you could actually think about averted costs of if you're doing something that saves energy through water conservation, it might help you save um, uh, something else, money elsewhere for another project that allows you to use that as a benefit for implementing an energy saving water management task, okay? Um, and in California, probably who's been involved in some of these uh, uh, proceedings for the last 10 or 15 years on energy and water? A couple of people, okay, yeah. Um, we've been talking about this for a while, right? And so back going back into the 2000s, there was a California Energy Commission staff report that dug into lots of different aspects of energy for water management in Los Angeles. And then the CPUC studied this on multiple rounds. Um, also uh, in, in that decade and the next decade, 
um, and there's a series of reports on that. In 2016, Senate Bill uh, 1425 uh, from Senator Pavley, they established the Voluntary Water Energy Nexus Registry to track GHGs from this. And so this is, actually, this is an important area where the rubber meets the road as to why do we really care about the energy for water management. It's because of greenhouse gas emissions, because we're bringing water utilities into this overall umbrella of the larger goals of the state to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, revert them to 1990 levels uh, in, the next, in the coming decades. So that's the background, that's why we care. Beyond that, researchers love this topic because there's so many different ways to slice and dice it and carve it up, right? Now I'm a systems analyst and I always am looking at the big picture, sometimes with the annoyance of utility managers, say no, 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 stop looking at the big picture. I need to make sure I don't run out of water and I don't run out of money. That's what I gotta do. And so you, you, I gotta like, uh, balance the, the fact that you're looking at the big system as well as looking at the, at the small systems operations too. But <clears throat> with this energy for water question, I really think there are some potential very large pitfalls if you don't, if you don't examine the broader picture of, of all of the different ways that energy goes into water management. So that's what we really tried to do in this uh, task, um, energy for water management in Los Angeles. Now, local supplies, as mentioned in uh, the previous session, the, uh, the local supply for SFPUC as well, several of the metropolitan areas, but especially in Southern California, are talking about the idea of local supplies. And local supplies means essentially alternative supplies, stormwater capture, water reuse for indirect, uh, indirect potable reuse, non-potable reuse, or potentially in the future, direct potable reuse. Um, also, groundwater management, uh, groundwater supplies. In LA, actually, we traditionally, a lot of the water comes from groundwater supplies. I'll mention that really quickly. But there are several utilities, uh, several agencies, cities, that have local water supply goals. You may have seen these recently. Santa Monica had a, was on track to uh, cut, uh, uh, slice uh, water, um, imported water, and they're declaring now, I think, 2023 to be able to do that, which is pretty aggressive, considering that the last Two rounds ago, the water management plans, they were looking at 70, 80% imported water for all their needs. Uh, City of Los Angeles uh, has been very aggressive with this as well. One of the collaborators on this study, Katie Micah, who was at UCLA, is now with the city and she's writing the new update to the Sustainable LA plan that will incorporate these goals that have been outlined by the current mayor for cutting imported water and now get it reusing all of the rape waste water for the use in the city, and it's big time, right? This is a place of four million people, it drives markets. Um, and uh, throughout this project, I'll be setting up Nick, who's gonna talk about some of that stuff in, in, in a big detail. So as we're thinking about this big picture, it's a lot of work from agencies as well as academics and researchers and engineers and practitioners to put this all together. But it's not a new topic because here, we're really changing a system. This is the opening of the LA Aqueduct, uh, in uh, 1913, supplying cities to city water to the city of Los Angeles. Originally, interestingly enough, uh, one of the biographers of William Mulholland, the key engineer, said that William Mulholland's original intention for this was actually to recharge groundwater in the San Fernando Valley, at the time which is very agricultural. That kind of sounds like managed aquifer recharging to me, right? Which is what we're trying to implement at a large scale in California at this point too. So there are aspects of this that are new, but there are aspects of this that are old as well in terms of getting more water from local supplies, getting it into groundwater basins where we can recharge it and use it and store it for later instances. And LA is quite well endowed for this. We have very large groundwater basins in that part of uh, California. Now when I say Los Angeles, I've already sort of previewed at it, but anytime, if you remember one thing coming out of this, coming out of this talk is that when you hear something about Los Angeles, the first question you should say is which Los Angeles? Are you talking about the city? Are you talking about the metropolitan area? The city's four million people, the metropolitan area, which is essentially here south of the, uh, south of the mountain ranges, about nine million people, or LA County moving up into the, uh, into the Antelope Valley, 10 million people, right? So there are, di when you hear that LA is, is gonna reuse all of its, its wastewater by 20, 20, 2035 or whatever it is, that's LA City, right? LA County is different and when you move to the scale of LA County, you gotta think about 100 different agencies, a hierarchy of importing, wholesaling, and retailing water, it's super complicated. It also means it's really fun to study from an academic standpoint. So um, I started as a postdoc in 2014 at UCLA 
and uh, we've put together the, a very large, we, we decided that a network flow model was a good way to answer some of these questions about what's the potential for local water supply in Los Angeles, given all these retailers, given all these agencies, given all these potential politics, given the cost and everything else like that. Now, this is a huge network flow diagram of all the infrastructure, all the agencies, all the groundwater basins, everything that's in the system. We took a couple of years to inventory all this stuff. We worked with a lot of the agencies to collect data on it. I should, this probably belongs better across the street at the Game Developers Conference, right? One of these big network development models or something, right? I could pay more money too, I don't know. But, uh, but we put it together and we're using simulation and optimization and it's not giving us the right answers. It is letting us investigate trade-offs in the system and understand better how things work. So we've used the model to look at eight or nine different tasks now. We looked at groundwater management uh, in the uh, governance in the basins. We looked at the, at the how governance across the agencies might change with different flows of water supply. We looked at trade-offs in water demand and conservation, including conservation targets that wrapped in some work from collaborators on this project that actually had uh, on, uh, measurements of species specific tree water use in the Los Angeles Basin. So how much a sycamore uses, how much uh, acacia uses, so forth. We wrapped that all in to uh, the, the demand side of the model and then looked at conservation targets. Uh, we looked at the economics. I don't have time to go into that, but if you're interested in it, we have to start rethinking the way we do water utility economics if we're gonna, if we're gonna move the ball forward on some of uh, these alternative water supplies. Uh, we looked at the effects of all of these great alternative water supplies on stream flows, because we also have this goal of restoring the LA River with having it be like a flowing channel where you can kayak in and so forth, right? Great, I love rivers, I love urban rivers, it's fantastic, but there are trade-offs. So if you're capturing all this water within the modeling, it'll tell you you're gonna see lower stream flows downstream, and those support a whole host of end uses for anything from lifeline supplies for uh, transient populations to recreational uses to amenities to diversions in some parts of LA. There's a lot of trade-offs. And so we've been looking into this for a while. We've been publishing papers and also trying to make it applied research um, that it actually has some consequence. And I'll throw this up there because these are all the folks that kind of like helped and talked to, you know, inside of UCLA and outside of UCLA on in developing the model. And my main point in saying this is, is this wasn't kind of this academic exercise where you get like five PhDs together, go into a room, come out two years later, and we need food, so we'll create a model and code for food, right? And so this was actually, we were engaged, trying to work with agencies. They gave us a lot of data. The agencies in LA, I generally found them to be really informative, um, helpful, and they provided a ton of information for us to help kind of put this big picture together as the role of the university can kind of, you know, come up with what's the umbrella uh, picture that we're, that you might shoot for along a long way down the line. So you understand a little bit about the background of the project, how um, how we have kind of this set of tools to be able to assess this question, which is modeling energy for water management in Los Angeles. And it's a pretty interesting question because we know from a lot of that prior work that the energy intensity of those imported water sources, when you get down here in California, getting it over these ridges in the coastal line makes the makes that imported those imported water supplies pretty energy intensive. Somewhere on the order two to four thousand kilowatt hours per acre foot. Um, I'm not going to translate into million gallons or anything else. Um, but the the three main pipelines here, though, you do have to look at individually. So the so the Metropolitan Water District is in responsible for importing water from the Colorado River Aqueduct and the California Aqueduct through the State Water Project. Um, those have uh, growth and net energy use. It, you need energy to get that water into LA. The Los Angeles Aqueduct, is energy, it, its energy baseline is zero, or it could even be energy producing, but the, the LADWP doesn't use the uh, hydroelectricity that's produced along the LA Aqueduct for offsetting the energy used in other parts of it. It's just basically we kind of consider it zero for net energy use. Okay, so between these sources, there are differences. You can't just say that imported water is energy intensive. You can't just say that local water is not energy intensive, right? There are trade-offs in these. <clears throat> but if you want to take the systematic perspective, the life cycle perspective, the big picture perspective, 
You need to think about from the utility side, importing, conveying, treating water. And then there's the difference of gross versus net. Gross energy use would be the total amount of energy just expended all the way along the line. Net energy use would be if you produce energy here, it can go towards potentially offsetting some energy used elsewhere in the system. So net would be lower than gross if there's some energy production available. Now I would make an argument though, Nick and I were just talking about this, that for greenhouse gas emissions, you need to think about that a little bit differently because if you expend greenhouse gas emissions over here and you produce energy over here, it's not negating that greenhouse gas emissions uh, expenditures that, were, that took place say upstream or whatever. It's only in this like scheme of carbon offsets that that takes place, which may not necessarily relate to energy. So again, you have to be systematic in thinking about this energy and water relationship and what are you really targeting. But then you also have to think about water in households. And this is, this is highlighted in some of those original reports, but generally not well touched in research literature. And so I'll show you some results that compare utility water, uh, energy for water use and uh, household water for energy use. So how do you calculate the results? We went through and for each of these different links, we came up with the energy intensity. We either asked the agencies, bugged the agencies, or we used literature when it wasn't available. So we literally put up energy intensity of blank per kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hour acre foot onto each of those links. And then the model totals it up as you're running through these scenarios of supply and demand. And you have some issues to consider. Uh, oh, so I'm sorry, the, so the total energy then would be flow times energy intensity. Uh, across a particular link. I mean, total energy use across system would be all that summed up. But there's some issues to consider. The attribution. If you have a hierarchical network, Metropolitan expends energy to move the water into uh, the LA basin, or maybe they're, they're offsetting it within their system. And uh, at the local level, uh, the retailer doesn't see those energy costs, right, or energy expenditures. And they just get that water from that. Who's responsible for those energy expenditures and the potential greenhouse gas emissions implications of those, right? Is it the retailer? Do you attribute it all to the retailer? Do you consider it throughout the system? You know, there's some tricky issues and that gets into like the governance aspects of all this. Um, and then gross and versus net, like I mentioned. And then also total energy use versus energy intensity. The total energy use uh, across for a pipeline or a system would be just what's the kilowatt hours, right? But energy intensity or um, uh, it has a couple of terms in literature, but essentially it's just the units of energy for a, uh, um, a particular uh, uh, quantity of water. So acre foot or gallon or whatever. So kilowatt hours per acre foot, for instance. <clears throat> so here are some of the coefficients. Um, we did a lot of this work through a project that was funded by the Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, Mark Gold and Katie Micah uh, do, uh, you know, pulled a lot of these numbers. Um, and sometimes we could get them from the agencies, from some of the larger agencies they provided. They just quantified the energy within their system and then divided by their amount of water and so you get an energy per acre foot um, uh, usage. But then sometimes it wasn't available so we actually broke down in literature what the energy intensity was for different treatment uh, parts of the treatment train. Um, and then the imported water, we got these numbers from State Water Project, uh, DWR, um, as well as NET, and uh, worked with LADWP to figure out the energy intensity of the LA aqueduct. Um, conveyance, this one's a tough one. I'll talk about why in a second. And ocean desal, there's not really desal in LA um, right now. We were modeling existing conditions um, for, yeah, Peter? Oh, I think you need a microphone, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah, so the parentheses here um, within the line that says state water project imported water, it's gross versus net. Because throughout the system, depending um, where you are, you either have gross or net because there's hydropower business. Yep. You have to make some assumptions for that conveyance energy. Um, and that's because you can't possibly collect, you can't understand the conveyance energy for 100 different retailers in their systems throughout. So we developed this, we went back to that boring physics uh, and engineering stuff that you hoped you'd never see again. Bernoulli's equation, potential, kinetic, and pressure head. You can use that to calculate power and then you use it over time to calculate energy. If you want more information on it, let me know, I'll send you the, spread uh, I'll send you the spreadsheet. So we did that for every retailer. We looked at the differences. 
between where we assumed the low point in the system or the central point would be and moving it out. And we used that to fill in that gap of we, know all, we knew all the energy intensities across the other aspects. Then for each retailer, we gave it a specific conveyance energy intensity based on that. Uh, based on that physical modeling, and all models are wrong, and some are useful. Hopefully, this falls into the category of useful models. Um, so this is now results. I'll do a couple of slides on on what we actually found. Um, so this would be utility system energy use by process, and so you can see here imported water supply um, is the red line, and uh, across the bottom axis here, it's different scenarios of water management. So we're essentially throughout the system decreasing the amount of available imported water that's supplying the system. There are shortages that incur from that, right? So we're not saying that all these are technically scenarios you'd want, but just modeling what the, what the effects would be. You can see that imported water supply is, uh, is by far the largest component of energy use within the system. Um, and second is conveyance, but as you move less water around, your conveyance energy decreases. And then sewage treatment and groundwater management, they actually, and just the modeling framework ends up trying to pump more groundwater, you know, as a, uh, from uh, the, the basins, so you see the groundwater energy uh, move up a little bit. So you can see between the first graph and the second graph, uh, this is average annual gross energy versus average annual net energy. If you include those hydropower produced offsets and so forth, um, fairly simplistic framework. It does decrease the energy, uh, total energy use of the system. And similarly, the energy intensity of the system also decreases, which makes kind of sense because it's all kind of linear modeling and so forth. But you do see the energy intensity of the system decrease as you remove imported water from that whole system. If you look at the conveyance, this is actually very interesting. There's been some nice work from Ned Spang, Frank Lode at UC Davis. Some of you might be familiar with it. They looked at East Bay Mud's territory as well as LADWT's territory. Um, and you can see that within a retailer district, as you push water out, the elevation changes and the distance throughout the system make, uh, uh, makes a difference in that energy at the edges of the system, or I'm sorry, water uh, supplied to the edges of the system or water supplied to the high points in the system is much more energy intensive than water that's kind of either close to the source or uh, within a low point in the system, right? But you can talk to, Ned, this is a really difficult uh, thing to calculate because uh, you have to tally up this like network flow model for these distribution networks that have thousands of components. It's very difficult. So this hope this kind of provided a snapshot which does help complement that more data intensive approach of what's in your utility service area for a larger modeling framework uh, in this sense. You see differences in, in uh, the seasonal uh, energy intensity. With, uh, and that's mainly due to higher amounts of um, water use in the summertime. Um, but it does change, so your, your system is more in energy intensive uh, in the winter, in the summer months than it is in the winter months. And then finally, this is actually a big point. So you total up, you remember that there was 44,000 or so gigawatt hours total for utility level energy use. The in-home use, heating water for uh, supply far exceeds that. And this was something that was outlined originally in 2005 uh, in those reports, and it, but this gets to a very difficult policy question of getting households or buildings to, to change their behavior, do something different, providing rebates and so forth. In addition, if you also want to think about the greenhouse gas emissions implications of this, we primarily heat water in homes with natural gas. And natural gas, uh, emissions are, it's a more energy intensive, uh, a greenhouse gas emissions intensive fuel source than electricity supplied from the grid, especially if we move towards renewables. And there's a very tricky policy uh, difficulty here in fuel switching and funding that fuel switching that the CPUC and the CEC have been working through for a while. So if that's of interest, we can talk about it a little bit more in the, in the question and answer session. But as a takeaway, the in-home uses just for water heating do far exceed what the utility uh, management um, needs are. I'll skip those slides um, and just a few insights. As I was putting this together, here is a tweet from uh, Gerald Steinberg, mayor, our mayor in Sacramento. And he mentioned uh, that this is actually, this fuel switching question is a real issue and it matters for the water, en energy water nexus uh, 
question in Los, in uh, California because in-home uses are do exceed utilities. We need to bring utility water utilities into the greenhouse gas emissions accounting framework and so forth. But without addressing those in-home uses, then we're just not quite hitting the mark on how we get to wide-scale reductions in GHG rates. So with that, uh, here's my contact information, and hopefully I set up Nick very well for talking about direct potable reuse uh, in LA. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you, Eric, for setting me up so well. And thank you guys for joining us today. I'm really excited to share this with you. Um, what, what we're going to be talking about today is the energy intensity of looking at new recycling, recycling for the future, potentially direct portable reuse, sorry, energy intensive. So before I start, let me give a little bit of context. Uh, this project is funded by the California Energy Commission. So in particular, we're going to be looking at the impacts of doing these new or maybe more energy intensive recycling strategies to the power grid. And so again, energy for water, but looking at it from, from the perspective of the power grid. And that's our office. We do a lot of um, policy relevant environmental analysis. Happy to talk more about that. I have a lot to get through, so I'm gonna be going. Please feel free to stop me if you have questions. Uh, again, there will be time at the end for sort of the higher level questions. So in this presentation today, I'm gonna to be talking about a couple things. I want to make sure everyone's on the same page and that we're moving together, we're talking about the same things, because there's so many different pieces of water recycling that people can often get lost in translation. So I'm going to talk about the context and definitions behind some of the things I'll be discussing. Then we'll talk about the research that we actually did, and then move on to sort of our conclusions, what we think is coming next. So, <clears throat> oh, I've tried to do something interesting here, where I've actually covered all the words in my slides because they can get quite wordy. I tried to make it so that it was usable and readable for those who are not here with us today. Um, so I'll be skipping through some of the text, but I'll be telling you all the information regardless. Uh, what I meant to, to demonstrate here, and I think Eric covered it, is what are the different sources for imported water to, Cal to Southern California, in particular LA? And Eric covered these three green lines, the California Aqueduct, Los Angeles Aqueduct, and the Cal Colorado River Aqueduct. And in red here, we see one of these, a selection of earthquake faults, in particular San Andreas Fault, is a major one. And what this is showing us, those circles are the points where the San Andreas Fault crosses these uh, large water infrastructure pieces. And this is a recognition of the susceptibility of our water imports to this kind of tragedy. Um, in addition to this, California is also facing a lot of climate change. The Southern California Water Agencies are pushing to develop more renewable, more sustainable, and as Eric mentioned, more local supplies. That's gonna be a really large driver in this question about do we do recycling, and if so, do we do it for portable use? So again, to make sure everyone's on the same page, I just want to throw it up there that even within Title 22, there are different levels, different qualities of recycled water. Not all recycled water is equal. And even this is a simplification, but at the bottom we start with secondary, what you might use for irrigation of farmland or crops. We move up one level and it's tertiary, tertiary treated wastewater, and that can be used for more urban uses, irrigation of golf courses, that sort of thing. And at the highest level, we have advanced treated water, and that's water that's generally treated from wastewater to a quality that is equivalent or close, relatively close to drinking water standards. What I want to point out here is that as the quality of these waters increase, so too does the energy intensity. And so we have to make have to have a discussion about the trade-off. The more the higher quality water that we would like to have, it requires us to invest more energy. And if you look at it from a fit for purpose perspective, well, we would only ever want to use the correct, correct treated level of water for the correct purpose. That is the most efficient way. But there's some challenges associated with that. And that's part of the California, the California water context. Now, within California right now, we do allow indirect portable reuse, or what's considered IPR. 
So we take water, wastewater, we treat it to a very high level, and we put it back into the groundwater, and then we extract it later on for, for drinking water. Now the state is considering, well, what about using that as potable water? And if we do use it as potable water, what are the requirements around that, and what's the timeline around that? So right now the state has a piece of legislature out, I believe it's 8574, where the state is required to develop some sort of guidelines regarding wastewater recycling for portable reuse, and that's by 2023. And so we're seeing that agencies are looking and considering this. Just last year, I believe at Water Reuse Conference, or the year before, Steve Moore at the State Water Board stood up on stage and said, much to everyone's surprise, water agencies, you should be planning direct portable reuse systems at some point. If you wait until 2023 when we come up with the guidelines, you're gonna be behind the curve. And so we're expecting that agencies are considering this and really looking, looking into the possibility of developing more and more uh, treated recycled water to this high level. And there are potentially some benefits to this. Now, <clears throat> this is a typical water use cycle. Many of you have seen this before. And what I'm gonna be talking about at first is this type of, of direct portable reuse, which is where we take water from the household, we collect it, treat it, move it into what I'm gonna call advanced recycling, and then move it back from advanced recycling directly to our households in what's called plan to plan. This is one of two strategies that we can use for direct portable reuse. And I wanna talk a little bit about why this is attractive to water agencies. There are a couple reasons that this approach is very valuable, and they tend all to do with economics. Um, expectedly, to develop a fit for purpose approach, you would have to have multiple lines moving multiple qualities of water around the city. And the city doesn't wanna do that for a couple reasons. It's not necessarily that the pipes themselves are too expensive. It's the cost of digging up the city. To halt that economic cost, to build an entire parallel water system is really quite a lot. One of the things that I, I heard from some LNWP officials is that they spend quite a significant portion of their, their revenue to maintain pipes, more than 50%. So what would it be like if we built a parallel system? Are you willing to take a, a, a doubling of your water rates just to accommodate that? Most people would say no, but they don't necessarily always think about that. So that's one of the benefits. The other benefit of potentially doing, let me, let me, let me scale that back a little bit. I'm not gonna say benefit. The other attraction of doing DPR as opposed to IPR is that DPR doesn't necessarily require storage. And so water agencies that don't have uh, legal rights to groundwater storage or don't have space that's cheaply available to build large engineered storing, storage buffers they might now have an opportunity to recycle their wastewater where in the past they didn't. And so although this water is potentially very energy intensive, it can be local. And so this might be a very attractive solution for agencies moving forward. In 2023 or further than that, when these approaches or these guidelines come out and this becomes a possibility, what happens if we see a lot of agencies adopting these, these types of strategies, this DPR strategy? And in particular, what happens, in particular, what happens when they adopt these process streams, and that's sort of our motivation. We wanna see if all these agencies simultaneously built these systems, which often include reverse osmosis, which we know is very energy intensive, how do we manage that on the power grid side? What does the power grid need to be, need to be prepared for? What does the, what do the load, load pockets look like for the energy system? And so that's the question we're answering here today. Again, very granular level. So to do that, the first thing we did was we established, well, what is the baseline? What is the energy used in the wastewater sector for LA County? And so we looked at LA County, again, not just LA, but the county as a whole, um, and we said, okay, where are the major wastewater facilities and how much water are they processing? So we looked at these agencies, and these are 16 of the largest agencies in, in LA County of a total of 27 or so, and they treat vastly different amounts of water indicated by the circle size, and we collected information on what are the unit processes that they're using at these facilities? How much, what is the energy inten intensity for their the water that they're pro producing, and what are they using it for? And this is essentially what we came up with. For LA County, this is the energy intensity for all these different facilities. And this might look scary, I'm gonna orient you just in one second because we're gonna see this graph again show up later. So on our y-axis, we have energy intensity, which is the energy per acre foot, the amount of energy it takes per unit of water to move or treat that water. On our x-axis, we have a couple different things. Here we or the top line we're seeing with all the letters, those are just indicators for the names of the facilities. Uh, this arrow is showing us that towards this side, my right, your left, I believe, um, we have increasing plant size. So this HYP is Hyperion, one of the largest plants uh, in LA County. And as we move to the 
other side, uh, those plants are smaller. And these plants have different treatment levels, secondary and tertiary. And so they're treating, to, they're treating their water currently to different levels. And we'll talk about what that does for direct potable release in a second. So this is our baseline. What does this mean? As Eric showed us before, energy intensity by flow, we are able to establish what is the total energy use in the wastewater sector. So across LA County for these facilities, this is our total energy use in gigawatt hours per year. I apologize, some of my text has cut off, the font has changed. Uh, but this is 505 gigawatt hours per year for LA County in the wastewater sector, and that's how much they're using. This is our baseline. If we're looking at GPR, we wanna understand when we build our GPR systems, is it gonna be, it might be 50 gigawatt hours, and you think, wow, that's a lot of gigawatt hours, but is it 10% of this, or is it 200% of this? That's really the question that we wanna understand. What kind of effect is it gonna have on the grid? So to do that, we looked at, now, what are the advanced water treatment processes we wanna consider? Well, agencies have a lot of flexibility. There are many ways to produce potable quality water. And when we asked them what they wanted to do, most of them said this. This is the Orange County Water District's um, advanced treatment facility or advanced treatment train that they use at their facility for indirect potable release. It, cons it consists of a microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and UV irradiation unit. And currently, they have had 10 years of operational success and a lot of support from the water sector in doing this kind of treatment. Agency said, hey, if I, if I was able to go to advanced treatment, I'm not necessarily gonna wanna go with the one that's new and very sexy. I wanna go with the one that is established and as a record of protecting public health. That's a really fair thing to say. So for our analysis, we use this as our baseline. We use this as our expected treatment train. But as I mentioned, this isn't the only one. We also considered some other treatment trains that are taking place in California or around the US. And so the first one is the Orange County treatment train. The second one is San Diego Pure Water. Uh, and that's, that essentially looks like a riff of the Orange County, but also includes, in pretreatment, ozone and uh, biologically activated carbon. The next line down is a potential pilot plant that Metropolitan Water District is considering using MBR, reverse osmosis, or membrane bioreactors, reverse osmosis, and UV. And all of these are in planning, piloting, consideration phases in California. This last process, what we're gonna call Pure Alta, actually is not in California. This is a plant in Florida. Um, and they are claiming to be able to produce highly treated, advanced treated water without a reverse osmosis unit. And a lot of our agencies are very interested in that because without a reverse osmosis unit, you drastically decrease the energy consumption for advanced treatment. And you also don't produce a really tricky and potentially harmful brine stream to manage. Especially if you're far inland, that can be really, a really hard thing to, to deal with. So we looked at these different treatment trains, and what we did was we modeled, based on plant size, what is the energy intensity per unit gonna be? And essentially what we're showing here is, as expected, there's some economies of scale. Now, this is what the energy intensity looks like for those three different treatment trains at these plant, different plant sizes. And you can look at any one of them, and what we're seeing is, to the, towards my right, your left, uh, those three RO processes, the Orange County Water District, Metropolitan Water District, and San Diego Pure Water Project have very relatively high energy intensity. And down sort of towards the bottom of all of them, you have the Pure Alta train, which has relatively low. That's the effect of the reverse osmosis unit. And in here, we've actually made very, not generous assumptions, conservative assumptions that these processes are going to be, th these are overestimates, I should say, for energy intensity which means that when I talk later about the amount of savings you can see, the savings are going to be underestimate. I'll get to that again. So I wanna be clear about what we include here in, this, in our analysis, because as Eric mentioned, it's really difficult to quantify all the different pieces of distribution energy intensity, conveyance, treatment. And so for our analysis, we assume that the energy intensity of a water, a water supply is comprised of conveyance, treatment, distribution, and waste management. And that can be things like brine management. And so for distribution right now, we've applied a flat estimate that there's some sort of, some level of, of pressurization that we have to do to reintroduce this water into our pipes, especially if we do it plan for plan. And I'm sure actually looking at Eric's data, I said, oh, I, I wanna include that in my, in my project. That seems interesting and very site specific. So there's definitely an opportunity for us to overlap there. Uh, we made some assumptions, some flat assumptions for all these facilities. Uh, but as I mentioned just now, what's difficult to quantify is waste management. If you are on a coast and you have an ocean discharge line, you might have the opportunity to discharge your brine at very, very low energy intensity. But if you are far inland and you have to do a lot of waste management to take this brine and either truck it somewhere else or re-inject into groundwater, 
or even dry it out, do zero liquid discharge, you have really, really high energy intensities, over 3,000 kilowatt hours per acre foot. So it really depends on what you decide to do. And for our analysis, we did not try to recreate every facility's site-specific condition and site-specific decisions. We just thought we couldn't do it. So what we did in the end is we did a break-even analysis to consider what kinds or what bounds we would put on this to guide agencies. But again, we'll get to that. So now that I've told you what we included, this essentially is our, our main results. As I mentioned before, for our wastewater facilities, we're using about 500 gigawatt hours. And if we were looking at every, each of the alternative treatment trains for advanced water treatment, this is how much energy we expect to add, right? And so we're looking at an increase of between doubling or tripling of what we're currently using if we were to switch to advanced water treatment for direct portable reuse. That is a lot of energy. Why would anybody choose to do this? Well, the answer, sort of, as Eric alluded to, we have to look at the bigger picture. The answer comes when we look at the bigger picture. So what we're looking at here is the total amount of energy, or total amount of water that can be produced in LA County using this advanced treatment process. And the reason we would take on such a large energy burden is potentially for a large water benefit, a large local water benefit, I'd like to stress. And so when I talk about 720,000 acre feet, 718,000, what does that mean? For those of us who don't count acre feet, that's about 57 or 60% of LA County total water. And each of these blue bars here represents a different water treatment facility. And while I think personally that 57% is a goal that is really high, I think you're assuming some of the best efficiencies out there that are not always possible and feasible, what I do want to point out, what I do think is achievable is that within LA County, we might be able to capture even the top two or three plants, the largest plants, and easily produce about 40% of LA County's water. So even if we didn't want to get all those small plants that are maybe far inland, we could really pick the lowest hanging fruit here and provide some water benefit for the county. So <clears throat> what I wanted to show here is that a lot of people talk about, oh, water recycling is really energy intensive. It's too energy intensive for us to do. Well, yes, that's true, but again, as Eric mentioned, context is everything. Looking at the bigger picture, compared to these alternatives, it actually is the lowest, least energy intensive, with DPR, Colorado River Aqueduct, State Water Projects, and desalination as alternatives. So we're looking at DPR. Yes, it's very energy intensive, but I want you to be aware that relatively, it just depends on where you are. If you're not pumping water from the State Water Project across the Chattachi Mountains to LA County, Yes, DPR is very energy intensive, but if you, are, if you are in LA County, Southern California, you should really examine that question of is DPR or is advanced treatment too energy intensive? So what we've done here again is move from the energy intensity to the total amount of energy savings, so that's energy intensity by slope, and we're showing that for that 718,000 acre feet, what is the maximum energy that we could use, shown here in blue, and for that same volume of, volume of water from these alternative sources, what is the range of energy consumption that we can expect? And we can see here the range of energy consumption for DPR for the same volume is going to be much lower than these alternatives. Well, that's where the value comes in. If I were to choose DPR instead of one of these alternatives, if I were to offset these alternatives using DPR, we see a net energy benefit to the state at the state level. So while in LA County, we see an energy cost increase or energy use increase, at the state level, we can see energy use benefit. And the benefit, really, when I look at the numbers, is about 0.8% of California's electricity usage. And you say, well, 0.8%, what is 0.8%? Why does that even matter? And so I move across to my two bar graphs here. 0.8% is a tiny amount, a drop in the bucket, compared to California's total energy use, total electricity use. But if I tell you that in ca California's total electricity consumption, that light blue section is what we use, as Eric mentioned, 8% for water management, not end uses, which is about 11%, but the 8% that's used for water management. Well, within that 8%, I'm talking about potentially 10% of that. So by shifting LA County alone, we could see about a 10% reduction in the amount of energy or electricity that we use for the water sector electricity consumption. So that is, to me, quite significant. I'm pretty excited about this opportunity to look at how we provide benefits or net benefits to the state in terms of electricity. So I'm going to move to this piece a little bit quickly, but one of the things that I'm excited about as a water engineer is taking this kind of knowledge and applying it and figuring out if I were working in a utility, how would I use this? So what? It's good to know. It's never going to happen. How do I use this to build something that's useful, to make a case to the State Water Resource Control Board or to my directors to show that I am providing a benefit? Well, what we did is we looked at what is the 
potential relative benefit. This is the break-even analysis where I took every one of my alternatives, uh, my import alternatives, and I said, I'm going to offset these by different water supply alternatives. And these energy intensities provide per acre foot how much energy savings I have. And what that means is that in the best case scenario where I use that no reverse osmosis ultra treatment train and I displace G cell, I'm going to have about 2,500 acre, 2,500 kilowatt hours per acre foot to play with. So what does it mean to play with? It means to play it to engineer into my system before I come back up to as much energy as I was using before. And that means for my waste management system, if I want to do pumping uphill and distribution, that's where that energy is going to come in. If not, if I don't use that entire amount, I can make the case to the state that I am providing a net energy benefit to them. <coughs> so one of, the, one of the considerations and policy alternatives that may come out of the legislation that we're discussing is this type of direct potable reuse strategy, where instead of taking water and putting it directly back into our households, we take water and put it back to our drinking water treatment facilities. This adds a second barrier of protection, a second barrier of treatment, but it also adds a lot of cost for pumping. And so we want to consider, well, is this even feasible? Is this going to provide us a benefit that we need to see? And so what we did is we looked at Hyperion and the LA Aqueducts and said, based on the energy intensities that I showed you, those break-even analysis, those excess energy that we can play with, is it even possible to take water from Hyperion and put it to the LA Aqueduct filtration plant, which is a big drinking water treatment plant for the city of LA? And <clears throat> this is what the cross-section looks like and what we would need to pump over. And the best case scenario, we do have enough energy to pump over that treatment to make it to the LA Aqueduct. In the worst case scenario, however, we don't. And so the answer is, it's going to depend. It's going to depend on what process, process train, treatment train do we use to provide DPR it, it determines whether we can actually get water to where we want it to be for these different strategies. So geospatially, what does this look like? These are the maximum and minimum extents for that energy intensity that I showed you, if we were pumping from Hyperion specifically. See, in the best case, we can pump to LA Aqueduct. In the worst case, we don't get anywhere close. And what might be a different solution to consider is, well, what if we have multiple plants that are sort of all across LA, and they all have different net energy intensities and different energy consumptions, how do we look at siting a facility that might best suit them? Well, we can look at the overlap between both of the extents, the maximum minimum extents to help us decide where is it that we actually can produce water and where can we pump to to produce this high level recycled water. So great, I'm being asked to wrap up, so here we are with my conclusions. Um, the conclusion is that with the adoption of uh, DPR in LA County, we are going to see some changes. Energy intensity might go up, up to a factor of three, but at the same time, we're actually going to be present potentially produce, providing energy benefits net across the state. And the last piece is that we could produce quite a lot of water locally if we really wanted to. And our next steps here are, again, strengthen the assumptions behind that tool, uh, discuss the questions around greenhouse gases and cost implications of this, because those are two important factors that might reverse the recommendations from this kind of analysis, and expand the scope of this to consider other areas within, L within Southern California. If we can make this big of a change with only LA County, how much could we change if we look to consider San Diego and the other areas? I do have to take a second to appreciate my acknowledgments, as well as all the many people like Eric that I had discussions with this on. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Oh. <laughs> Oh, uh, questions for Nicholas. Um, did you look at the uh, energy value and BTUs of the waste from the water processes to possibly incinerate it and get uh, energy use out of it? So no, for this analysis we did not. Actually, in my next step slide, one, one of the things that we do want to consider is on-site generation. That is, at these wastewater facilities, they're already producing a lot of biosolid waste that is producing biogas and therefore energy on site to offset their use, their energy consumption. In fact, some of these facilities produce so much energy that they can be off the grid for long periods of time. They produce more energy than they use. So if we were to maximize the amount of biosolids going into these facilities to produce as much energy as we could, is the grid really going to see this two or three times increase in energy consumption? We don't know. 
Uh, has anyone looked at uh, peak power and not just energy use? So peak power as it pertains to the water energy nexus, so as a motivator um, to move policy forward, et cetera? A little bit, yes. Um, some of the collaborators that have kind of helped contribute to this uh, looked at that question, I think in the household scale, right? And so the relationship between water use and energy use, and additionally, if uh, across the electricity grid um, <coughs> in California, peak power spikes in late afternoon and early evening hours due to air conditioning and so forth. And it also uh, dovetails into this uh, difficulty of when we're producing solar and it creates this duck curve, mm -hmm. right? And so all these issues are, are wrapped into this. Um, utilities tend to potentially be a little bit more flexible in some of their operations as to when they're, they're running systems. And so I think it's a big topic of interest to say, can we work with water utilities, wastewater utilities, and so forth to reconfigure when they're running these systems so they're doing it at times when there's either excess solar on the grid or um, when there's um, opportunities for you know using power um, generated from more renewable sources during nighttime hours when there's less demand. I haven't seen necessarily a full on what I'd consider systematic analysis of it as of yet, uh, but I think all of these things need to be uh, in the works including in-home water heating used as energy storage at the household level if you've got rooftop solar on there as well. Because um, the without the combination of energy storage and thinking about energy storage flexibly, we will have difficulties continuing to meet our renewable energy goals in the city. I did just want to add to that actually. One of the things that under this quick wet project we're also considering is what is the role of these wastewater agencies and drinking water agencies as demand response providers, uh, auxiliary, providing auxiliary services to the grid, spin up and spin down. We haven't explicitly looked at how peak power is influencing those their decisions, or at least at the policy level, because for the most part, water agencies are incentivized themselves to reduce their peak power, to bring that down as much as possible. So we're looking at trying to ask the question of, well, with time of use rate shifting, how does that affect water agencies' ability to be involved with demand response programs? So it kind of touches on the question, but doesn't answer it, unfortunately. So, Eric, just kind of a follow up to what you were just saying. Uh, so, what is the best way, from your analysis, to incentivize lowering in house residential energy consumption for water? Is this heat pump hot water heaters just incentivizing the heck out of that, or what's the best path? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. So, <laughs> uh, uh, incentivizing heat pump hot water heaters, which have become more cost effective, but um, I, so has anybody been involved, I have not been directly involved in the CPUC proceedings for about five years now, looking at this question of fuel switching. Has anybody been involved in this? Uh, okay, so a couple of folks, right? So this is a really tricky problem. It goes back to the 1990s and in the, in, in the inception of these rebate programs. So Energy Upgrade California, all of the utilities have these uh, util these energy uh, programs to incentivize energy uh, savings in households. It's generally made homes in California along with Title 24 regulations much more energy efficient, hasn't necessarily curbed energy use to the extent that maybe we thought we were going to a long time ago. But within the development, there was actually serious concern at the time of uh, competition because if you're an electric utility and you can pay for rebates to get to switch your gas over to electric, well, that's a business opportunity, mm -hmm. right? And so the CPUC kind of put up <coughs> this block against um, uh, against one type of fuel paying for rebates and another, and they used this three-prong approach where it had to make energy sense, environmental sense, and economic sense. And so generally in these rebate programs for the investor-owned utilities, the CPUC has the authority to oversee, to implement, so the utilities collect money and then they, um, they fund rebate programs from a voluntary adoption standpoint. We are getting smarter at knowing how to improve energy efficiency and we can apply uh, from adoption in homes and we can apply those lessons to figuring out how to get in home folks to adopt practices that we want to for say switching natural gas heat pumps uh, uh, water heating to electric heat pumps but we still have this policy regulatory issue to work through and this is actually a contemporary discussion that Folks have put a lot of energy into this, Natural Resources Defense Council and, and other folks into this question. It's very thorny, it's very tricky. If you're a gas company, you're not super excited about this. 
you know, staying and and they have a lot of infrastructure to pay for, and they have a lot of uh, you know um, uh, uh, residents to provide for, and they need to consider their bottom lines too. Plus, <laughs> considering fire management techniques, you know, in, in Southern California, some of the gas utilities and electric utilities are very involved in thinking broadly. So this is a, it's a very it's a very simple answer. Yes, switch in home water heating over to electric. And as we're moving the grid towards more renewable sources, it gives us opportunities for both energy storage as well as um, renewables. But it's much more ingrained. As it usually gets back to all the people in the organization. Customers are driving that, though, Eric. It's, it's going to happen. So, um, yes. So, Eric, I'm going to mess this up. But at some point in your presentation, you mentioned shifting the way rates are structured. Um, and maybe there's some different forces around that. I'd spoken earlier about like switching away from volume rates. Do you recall that point in your presentation where you mentioned that there might be a need for utilities to rethink the way that rates are structured? And can you speak to that a little more? Um, so yeah, sure. There's, so water utilities in California and throughout the West have generally done, a, especially the larger ones, have generally done a good job at moving towards rate structures that incentivize conservation more. So these these would be, uh, there's some fixed charge potentially within the rate structure, but then there's a volumetric charge as well. And Peter Mayer was here, and he's, he's the expert on this to talk to. I think he's, he's <coughs> up. So find Peter if you really want to know all the intricacies of this. Um, but the, then on the, on the flip side, they have to plan for long-term costs. And that's where you get into cost annualization. And that's the part where I think we can do some really innovative work on, because um, it, gets, it does get into the, the interactions between agencies, but if you're the city of Los Angeles looking between DPR, investing in DPR, stormwater capture, um, and continuing to purchase some amount of imported water from the Metropolitan Water District, those uh, annualized costs over time are changing, and they're changing at different rates. So the cost of imported water uh, is continuing to go up for a whole variety of reasons, legacy infrastructure, uh, environmental needs, um, it, when you look at the metropolitan wholesale and retail rate structures to its providers, it's on average going up about 6% a year, which is probably generally a greater increase than the, than the cost increases over time for some of these alternative sources, especially stormwater capture, but maybe likely you know, water reuse uh, opportunities too. So rate structures on one hand, they incentivize conservation. That has a bottom line impact on the utilities um, operations. So then they need to think creatively on their internal operation side as to what they're uh, they're going up, uh, spending on the long on the long term on different sources and and so that's a little bit different of a question about what the units are and what the how you do the calculations. The one thing I wanted you to speak to because you were talking about conveyance being a big financial driver for the water reuse in, in LA County. Here in Northern California, we don't have the big lift. We don't have some of those same concerns. So put it in the perspective of the water districts in Northern California. What, why is this important to them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as some of you might know Amy Talbot with the Regional Water Authority. I will invoke her name here. We were at a, a meeting um, at, at uh, OWP uh, a couple of months ago. And if you're familiar with it, the districts in the Sacramento area, Regional Water Authority, City of Sacramento, they were here earlier. Um, have done a lot of great work on in looking at alternative sources and so forth, but water flows down from the mountains. We have groundwater, which is a fairly in energy in un in intensive source, however you say that, uh, of water supply, and it's very hard to make the numbers pencil out for water reuse uh, from an energy perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So I think from as, as the standpoint of a water retailer that has uh, um, a, a less energy intensive water supplies, you need to think about multiple benefits. And what are those potential multiple benefits? It's more water for the environment, or it's capturing stormwater, which are helps you to meet your water quality requirements. Um, you, so you have to broaden the pot if you're gonna look at that. And, and the Sacramento area did do that, and it's still um, you know, just kind of tough to pencil out, but it's, it's a utility-specific question in multiple, multiple avenues. Yeah. Or replenished groundwater, which you talked about, was a big driver in LA at one time. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Oh, please. I, it just, when I see this happening, it's like 200 years ago, we could drink from every stream. Wh who's look, like, what is the, 
you know, what is the value of actually restoring the hydrologic system of California? Like, what if we restore our rivers to the point, like this aqueduct, like you were saying you understand if you take more water in, fr in LA, you're den denying downstream. Well, look what's happening, right, with the aqueduct. It's taking. And what if we stopped the aqueduct? What would be the benefit to the land, to overall groundwater recharge, et cetera? I just, I'm, I just want to ask that question because I feel like if what if like if we have a healthy world, how how valuable is that to us, and how do we study that now? Uh, yeah, I can take this one. <laughs> 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 Not helpful. Uh, yes, very valid question. Um, if you're a water manager, water researcher like myself, it brings up some mixed issues. So the stream flows in urban areas, especially in Southern California, are generally higher due to the wa interbasin water transfers that we have. And uh, some colleagues, Terry Hogue and Kim Manigo, who are on this, have a, a really nice study that looked in LA that the imported water that is brought into the basin increases the stream flow there, probably dilutes the, the pollutants that are there. So you might have the effect, they, they did show that the stream flows are increased. So it probably dilutes some of the pollutants that are in there. So you could make the argument, potentially, that there, the just dilution is the solution to water quality in LA, which is not fantastic, as, as many people know, uh, in streams and in the ocean, um, ha getting better over, over time, uh, is better because of this additional water that's there, right? But that water came from somewhere. Like you said, the Owens Valley Aqueduct, uh, Colorado River, we see the effects of these interbasin transfers on the upstream areas. Um, and certainly anybody who deals with the management of the California Delta recognizes that there are definite trade-offs in stream flows and diversions. Um, so the, the cities are in the unique place of being able to pay for solutions. Um, they're very large economic generators and they can potentially pay for solutions that would be win-win. So for instance, LADWP has been paying for restoration in the Owens Valley for a number of years, right? Um, it's, it's more difficult, I think, in the agricultural sector where the amount of, of revenue productivity you get from the agricultural uses of water is less than, the, than what's generated in, um, in an urban area and they use much more of the overall water that's diverted for um, human uses in California. So uh, cities definitely have a role to play in this and a very important role um, and the larger ones, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, they are involved in this uh, conversation to varying extents. And I'd say that there's, like I'm an observer, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, so I get to be a bit of an ethnographer. And I could probably say that there's progress over time, although the environmental systems have consistently uh, borne the brunt of water diversion. To your earlier point, stream rehabilitation could be one another benefit for a water district, right? So, um, other questions? Yes. Nick, you were talking at the beginning of the presentation about um, using the DPR system would require retrenching or double double trenching and double piping. But at the end of your slide, it looked like we could just put it back into the potable water treatment. So, can you talk a little bit about do we actually need double piping, or it was was that a, a convenient solution around that problem? Sure. Just to be clear, uh, when I talked about building a parallel pipe system, what I was describing is if we wanted to use fit-for-purpose water that is treated for tertiary levels, so not advanced treated potable quality drinking water, if we wanted to have two different qualities of water, we couldn't mix them in the same channels. We'd have to have two separate ones. In the case of direct potable reuse, if we put it back directly into our pipe distribution systems to go to our household, we eliminate that problem in some ways. In the case of direct portable reuse, where we have to pump back to our drinking water facility, there is still piping that needs to be built there, but it may be one single large pipe, as opposed to digging up many, many roads, building much smaller pipes. Anybody want to ask the last question of the showcase this year? Oh yeah, good. Volunteer. I thought that would be a deterrent, but no. <laughs> yeah, now I'm intimidated. 
but but I, but it does trigger just you know in our small town we're struggling with the do we do we lay a bunch of purple pipe we're we're generating um, uh, recycled water it's not potable right now mm -hmm. uh, we might be able to do some indirect recharge but but uh, you know as a city I'm wondering is that worth the investment to keep doing this purple pipe for when we get there mm -hmm. versus the you know because it you know the infrastructure cost is um, massive and daunting um, or do we just wait for this direct potable reuse and it kind of goes back to that the level of treatment for each application, but mm -hmm. what's the reality of the infrastructure <coughs> to, to do that? So if you could tell me the answer, that would just be awesome. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll just give you the answer, no problem. <laughs> Eric asked a good question. Would you mind telling us where you, where you are? Uh, San Luis Obispo. San Luis Obispo, okay. Uh, so from my perspective, I think in new developments and in areas that are not very dense, it is favorable to do uh, purple pipe, to build out a separate parallel system. You are getting closer to being more energy efficient, being uh, more fit for purpose. However, when we look at the future and we consider fit for purpose, we have to really think about the social impacts of this. Someone downstairs brought up the question of, if I use purple pipe water or some sort of lower quality water to flush my toilet, what happens to all the households with bidets? Do I want that water on my skin? It also brings up the question of what do you see your society looking like? If I use purple pipe to irrigate my lawns, consider all those times as a child that you grew up and you drank water from the hose and ran through your sprinkler. That changes the face of how we grow up. We don't, we can't allow, we wouldn't likely allow children to run around with purple pipe water with their sprinklers just going off. So when we talk about that, this question, we kind of have to look at, well, is running around in, in the sprinkler a valuable thing to me? Or do I just want to wait for purple pipe? Or is the area that I live in, are the new developments going to be so advanced or so energy efficient, so water efficient, and the land and the economic cost isn't too much that I would just rather build my purple pipe? The question really lies with the people that live there, in my perspective, <laughs> limited perspective. <laughs> uh, so uh, when folks ask me, you know, should LA do recycled water or stormwater capture, I usually say yes. And uh, you know, it strikes me that for a lot of cities, especially on the coast in Central and Southern California, so should I be planning for direct potable reuse or indirect potable use or more stormwater capture? The answer is yes, right? And so, but this question about the timing of specific investments is, is quite relevant and it's very difficult. So um, probably the, the way, we work a lot with stormwater agencies, actually in, in uh, slow and um, is one of them. And you have to fit these things in your capital improvement plans, and then you fit these things into the long-term planning and, and so forth, and what are your revenue sources, right? Um, and within communities, there's a specific, uh, there's usually a pulse on how interested they are in um, alternative sources from uh, like an environmentally beneficial perspective or something. So all those will, will change uh, based on your utility. But generally, if you have a community that's more interested in environmental benefits, then they might be willing to pay a little bit more for that. Um, you know, you could make that case through community engagement. I mean, the first thing I'd say, uh, which sounds maybe a little bit naive, is like you'd have to talk to the citizens and residents and find out. And I, you probably maybe have already done some of that, right? Um, and then from what Nick was saying, from the fit for purpose, we're, we're going to ne increasingly need to engineer these systems with adaptability so that we can make a switch in when we in two years or five years when we have a new new challenge that's ahead of us we can switch so would there be a way that you could design your system that you could implement a small scale measure somewhere down the line that would be adaptable for small scale on site reuse like the last panel was talking about with Amelia or um, for uh, like a growth area in the city that then you could be moving direct total reuse out there. Um, yeah, and beyond that, I mean, it's it's a tricky question, and mm -hmm. you probably just make the decision and then you go for it, and you convince folks that that's the right thing to do. But generally, if you're investing in further in water reuse infrastructure, I'd say it's moving in the right direction. Thank you, Thank you guys.